Um, I'm sure you've been listening to things all day, so you're probably quite tired by now. Um, so uh, I have no slides, which is probably quite shocking. Um, I'm just going to read and talk. Um, so first, I want to invite, uh, ask, um, or thank uh, Kit for the invitation. Um, and the question I, in the context of the festival, which is on the archipelagos of fragility. Um, the question I want to address here is both um, an artist as well as a, a researcher and a professor and someone who runs a research network uh, in Canada um, is a pretty simple one, which is what role um, do artists or designers that are working with contemporary science and technology play uh, at this historical moment? Um, it's a moment in which the world um, that we live in seems to be politically uh, socially, ethically, uh, and technically uh, out of control. Um, now, to give you a sense of how out of control it is, I have opened my laptop, uh, and, and during the day I get these RSS updates, you know, and the latest news. So today it's, of course, um, Brexit uh, and Donald Trump's impeachment inquiry in the U.S. But at the same time, there's these kind of strange, mysterious new scientist headlines that also magically slide across the screen daily. And, and each day they seem to increase in levels of unbelievability. For, here's an example. So for instance, when I was typing something the other day, um, the title across my screen said, have, quote, black holes hurled half of the universe into the wilderness. That appears on my screen. And then, of course, it disappears within a millisecond or so. Um, a few hours later, uh, another news flash appears as I'm typing something else, which says, quote, does science undermine human rights, unquote. Um, now, these almost sound like kind of absurd pronouncements, uh, and of course, they interrupt my very fragile workflow. Um, but one day, about a year ago, um, another thing appeared, uh, and this topped all of the other RSS feeds that I was telling you earlier which is the following. It says, quote, physicists mourn as hidden particle vanishes in leaked L8C data. That's the, that's the of course, the linear uh, hadron uh, collider uh, at CERN. So physicists mourn this hidden particle disappears. So I'm actually intrigued to, for this. Uh, compared to like Trump and Erdogan and all of these lunatics, I was like, what does this mean? So I, I go to newscientist.org. And I wonder, as I'm looking at that site, I wonder, why am I getting these RSS feeds from new scientists? What project did I do that unknowingly subscribed me to that uh, news feed? And I look, and the first headline reaffirms my awe, which is the following, quote, for nearly eight months, physicists have been waiting for confirmation of a potential new particle that could change our entire view of physics. Now it seems this hinted particle was nothing more than a statistical blip, unquote. Now, I'm, I'm struck by this kind of curious uh, prose, and I'm pausing to think that this was a missed opportunity uh, by not following this story more closely. Because after all, it's, it's something unusual when something that could rewrite Newton or Einstein or Niels Bohr or Richard Feynman's earth-shattering discoveries of physics is suddenly confused as a mere statistical uh, blip. Now, second, I'm also struck by the following headline. Physicists mourn as hidden particle vanishes. Now, one would have thought that mourning, um, this term mourning, was reserved for carbon-based creatures and not for statistical constructs. So from impeachment to California wildfires, which of course are burning up half of the state of California, or even the newest social media sensation of Generation Z, which I read this morning, you know, people are wearing pink hoodies that say, okay, boomer, have a terrible day, it's against the baby boomers. What all these apocalyptic pronouncements and revelations seem to have in common is this concept that they articulate the world in which science and technology are clearly on a kind of rampage. Where the, the age-old um, distinctions, or the ones we used to think existed as distinctions between culture and nature, science and society, politics and technology are being smashed to pieces with each new sensor, each new self-driving car, 
each new deep learning algorithm or each new induced uh, pluripotent stem cell. Some kind of recent scientific transformations that we are dealing with. And what's going on? So um, Duke, Duke University environmental climate researcher Peter Half has a name for this unending melee of science and technology, which he calls uh, the technosphere. The technosphere uh, is defined by half as the following, quote, in recent Earth history, a new Earth paradigm has emerged, the collection of interlinked systems that comprise regional to global scale technology. Large scale technology, or what he calls the technosphere, is the term used here collectively for power, communication, industrial, governmental, military, and other widely distributed and interconnected technological systems whose function, uh, on whose function modern civilization society is actually based. Right? So this technosphere is this combination of all of these complex um, systems, communication, agriculture, farming, industrial systems, governmental systems, computational systems, and, and so on, that are all kind of linked together. Now, what half invokes by this word is a kind of new global construct in which environmental, political, scientific, and economic strata operate in a kind of interdependent and interlocked series of parts to constitute a new state of existence for us. This technosphere functions never completely outside of our control, but also never wholly within it either. In other words, it's a kind of autonomous system, right? It's not completely out of con our control, but at the same time, it functions outside of our understanding. It's a conglomeration that's fed by, by fossil fuels. It's operations ultimately inaccessible to our meddling of human agents. At the same time, we're responsible, of course, for its existence. At the same, it's also exceedingly complex due to the dynamic intertwining of its parts. You know, we're trying to grapple more and more with this complexity of the situation we live in, this intertangling, this intertwining of parts that we, that, that we don't understand as a whole. Now, although this technosphere can and must be influenced by us um, because we're essential for its operation and management, we are also actually just parts in it. We're subordinate parts. As Half says, quote, the technosphere's operation will tend to resist attempts to compromise its function. So how is it possible that we've built something that we control or we partially control, and at the same time, basically, if we try to intervene, uh, it tries to stop us? It's a very strange concept. Now, what's more intriguing and not surprising, considering that this concept comes from someone like Half, who's an environmental scientist, is this argument that the technosphere complements a new kind of geological order. And everybody knows this term, you've probably heard it today, which is, of course, the age of the, the Anthropocene. Now, as, as you know, this term, the Anthropocene, is originally used to describe a potential fourth period of the Cenozoic era that happens after the so-called Holocene, okay? So it's, of course, the it, geological con uh, construct. But more recently, Anthropocene has become a concept that has been radically reinvented um, by the Nobel Prize-winning Dutch atmospheric chemist Paul Crutzen and the late American biologist Eugene Sturmer. And this was happened in the 1990s. And, and the Anthropocene in that context describes the increasing impact that humans are having on ecological and, uh, and geological processes, right? So in that sense, the Anthropocene is very clearly about our influence um, on, on the Earth. So complementing the strict you know, human-centric view of Crutzen's Anthropocene, Peter Half, in the notion of the technosphere, adds this additional complication that the technosphere increasingly imposes its own requirements on our own behavior, right? So we have these two messy things, the Anthropocene, which we're responsible for somehow, and this technosphere, which we're responsible, but, but at the same time, we're not. Now, let's go back to this original question, which I had, which is, so as artists who work with science and technology, which is, of course, what Kick uh, is based about, what role can we play in this technospheric condition, especially when we 
we, it, the difficulty is to intervene in that. Okay? Are we just responding to these partially driven, uh, human-driven, out-of-control situations? Right? So we're just basically in response mode. Are we complicit in them? Or do we actually still harbor kind of fantasies of resistance that somehow, through an aesthetic act, we can use the human imagination to thwart the operation of a sphere of technical power and influence that we actually can no longer comprehend? That's the question I want to throw at everybody today. And I think it's a question that's on a lot of people's minds at the moment. In fact, it would seem actually through its increasingly startling claims that natural engineering and computer science themselves are actually eclipsing uh, the arts as the new avant-garde. Now, this is, of course, provocation. So my question is, how can artistic practice be relevant uh, in a scientific world gone haywire, in a world in which we sue algorithms in court, we think about the ethics of autonomous cars, or we try to comprehend particles basically, that suddenly vanish without a trace. Now, one would think these questions would be resolved in the current discourses around the arts and the science, art and science, right? So, okay, well, if you, if you can't beat them, join them, in a sense. Like you, so what, let's say the arts will join the sciences in order to solve these problems, right? And this is a lot of rhetoric right now about art and science and these new collaborations and innovation and all of this. So, well, why is this? Okay. Well, first, there's an assumption um, that, that there's an interesting thing about this art and science debate, and there are some problematics in it that I want to put forward. First of all, if we talk about art and, assumption, art and science, there's an assumption that art and science are actually one thing, that there's one art and there's one science. In other, in other words, that the sciences and the arts are essentially unified disciplines. But the arts are not unified. It's probably even, even in this room for artists, you know that your practice may actually not necessarily relate to somebody who's been trained in classical music or doing ballet or something else. Um, there's as much distinction among the methods and training and practices of artists, uh, digital artists, or dancers, or theater makers, as there is between molecular biologists or particle physicists, for instance. Right? So this idea of art and science is problematic because there's no singular notion of art. Um, most of the rhetoric, however, surrounding this proposition assumes that science actually functions under a single set of methods and procedures which are equally shared among scientists. And this is a concept that's actually come under fire for a long time from not only sociologists and anthropologists who have studied how science works in laboratories, in practice, but also from natural scientists themselves. Now, what is most critical is an understanding of the political ramifications of how different cultures make knowledge. Okay? This is what's called... Um, the, the German sociologist Karen Norsatina calls this epistemic cultures, episteme meaning knowledge, and so that, like the different cultures, like and how do different cultures validate or value knowledge. So she says the sciences, or even many, all practices, quote, are pursued by groups of specialists who are separated from other experts by institutional boundaries which are deeply entrenched in all levels of education, in most research organizations, in career choices, and in our general systems of classification. Okay, so in other words, like in order to have a certain culture of knowledge, you have to erect walls around it so it doesn't get polluted by other things around it. And that doesn't just go for the sciences and universities, but it also goes for actually how art, the arts uh, uh, work as well, right? They're also, they're walls around different art forms. Okay, so that's the first thing, is that the different art and science have different ways of looking at the world, uh, and different, and the arts and the sciences have, within those categories, also smaller categories that have different ways of looking at the world that may not even relate to the other practices around them. Now, the second idea is that, um, you may have heard this before, it's like, okay, we talk about art and science, we compare the studio 
the artist studio and the laboratory. Now this was a topic that was dealt with actually here in, in, in Belgium in Antwerp in 1999 in a quite well-known exhibition that Barbara van der Linden and uh, Hans Ulrich Obrecht curated called Laboratorium. If people don't know about this, you should look, out the, look at the catalog. Because it's very interesting to try to look at the relationship between the studio uh, and the laboratory. Now, this mix between the studio and the lab is an, an interesting concept. It's the idea that the individual scientist's side of practice, the laboratory, parallels the artist's side of practice, which is the studio, right? At least in the visual arts uh, or the media arts. Now, this equivalency is problematic because it suggests that all artists are visual artists that use studios. So for instance, in the context of the performing arts, if anyone's trained in that, you know you don't go in the studio. You go in the rehearsal studio and you work there for four or five or six or seven hours a day and then you leave. You know, you don't leave anything there. Um, now, secondly, what's interesting is that historians of science have talked about a lot about the origin of laboratories. Um, and the earliest organized laboratories actually date back to around the 16th century. So, you know, not, not so long ago, I mean, in the span of human history. Um, and the laboratory at that point denoted the workshops of alchemists uh, or apothecaries or metallurgists, right? So these were private spaces. They were not, um, they were not kind of industrial um, spaces like we know laboratories today. Um, the laboratory, basically as we understand it now, is a physical infrastructure that was equipped for scientific experiments and for training a future scientist then is actually a pretty recent invention. It actually only goes back to basically to the 19th century. So um, in, in 1820, the first major kind of university laboratory was founded. It was at the so-called University of Berlin, which at that time was called the Friedrich Wilhelm von Humboldt University. Uh, and um, this Friedrich Wilhelm University basically brought about this idea of the modern notion of the lab. And the laboratory was conceived as a bureaucratic institution with different instruments and different divisions of labor. Um, but also, and this is a quote from Henning Schmidgen, who's a historian of science who's done a lot of work on laboratories, um, quote, an exchange or transit point of discourses, concepts, and recipes where ideas and physical materials could be confronted with each other and combine in increasingly interesting new ways, unquote. Now, even more importantly is the fact that laboratories became new centers of teaching. You know, and, and, and this is a critical difference between the vision of the private artist studio as something viewed as a kind of place away from the bureaucratic structures of academic education, uh, which is still promoted in, in for instance, um, you know, kind of um, universities, uh, art and design universities, uh, particularly in Germany. Um, now, Work on the laboratory is very interesting. So, so Schmidgen talks about the history of the laboratory, and he says that um, there were university professors in the mid-19th century who saw the laboratory as a new site to combine experimentation and teaching, right? So you would experiment, and then you would also teach the next generation um, it, with these possibilities. And so you would bring together knowledge production with practical knowledge. So in other words, knowledge production would be called epistime or episteme, and then handicraft or practical knowledge, which, which we now call techne, right? So techne goes back to the Greek, which means basically skill or practice or work um, or craft. And as you know, um, the term art or ars in Latin um, meant essentially a translation of techne uh, from, from the Greek. So this idea that the laboratory would combine experimentation with knowledge production and also practical skills was very important. But the end goal was the same. It was the transmission, the production and the transmission of new knowledge. And that essentially is what we call today uh, research, right? Which is the production of new ways of knowing the world. Now, in contrast, um, we understand the model of the artist studio uh, today in a very different way than actually was operating in the Renaissance. So in the Renaissance, you actually had something called the bottegas, which were these active workshops where masters like El Greco, for instance, who had like hundreds of people working for him painting his paintings, um, they basically imparted 
knowledge and practical skills to their apprentices who were doing the work. Okay? So in fact, those bottegas were actually uh, teaching places. Then, then this concept emerged called the studiolo. And the studiolo was a private place in the apparatus of the bottega where the artist could go for private contemplation and meditation, almost. Um, and these were actually not only in these, lab in these um, bottegas, but they were also in the, patron, the patrons that supported the artist's homes. So they would kind of flee after a busy work day and go to these kind of private spaces. And so what happened was this separation between the kind of workaday practical skills of the bottega shifted to basically this site of privacy and devotion for the artist uh, him or, uh, himself, mainly. It wasn't certainly herself at the time. Now, as you know, like if you think about artist studios today, um, and, and Carolyn Jones, uh, our historian, has critiqued this notion that you know, the kind of dominant topos of American artists was the kind of uh, the solitary male genius after the war, the sole witness of the miraculous creation of art. You can think about the studio uh, not as this private place, but if you people think about Andy Warhol's factory uh, or the studios of people like Oliver Eliasson or Damien Hirst, where they have basically a huge industrial apparatus, right? It's not someone going into a private zone and meditating. Now, there are actually some similarities between laboratories and studios, um, particularly what Michael Century called the studio lab. The laboratory, like the studio, has been constantly discussed as this site of kind of con concrete material practices in which we construct new kinds of knowing the world. And these ways of knowing the world are kind of natural and culturally hybrids, basically. They're mixed together. They're constructed, they're nursed, they're shaped, and they're reconfigured through the tools, the technologies, and the infrastructures of these sites. Um, so the sociologist Nora Satina says that laboratories are a kind of constructive environments that, quote, improve upon the natural order in relationship to the social order. And they, they focus on how we kind of manipulate what we call natural objects. And these natural objects may start out as some natural phenomena, but then they're transformed uh, as they're operated upon, and they become more and more cultural things, basically, that no longer have any relationship to nature, as we call it, itself. Um, but even this idea of experimentation and transformation of natural to artificial things is shaped by a different set of conditions. So in um, 2010, I organized a, an interesting meeting at V2 in Rotterdam um, of, of artists, of sociologists, of, of uh, science, of um, physicists, of psychologists, computer musicians, um, to try to deal with the question of vibrancy, like the, 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 the discussions that were coming up about the time about vibrant matter uh, and kind of material agency. And it was very interesting to see this tension between the artists and the social scientists and the natural scientists. Um, several of the artists present were, were really interested and inspired by scientific phenomena in their work. Um, and they wanted to, of course, get away from the idea that they were the only ones creating the work. They wanted to say, yes, these forces that we use, these materials, are also part of the mise en scene, you know, part of the, part of the apparatus. In, in contrast, in that meeting, Andrew Pickering, who's a well-known uh, sociologist of science, who's now increasingly been more accepted in the media arts scene as opposed to the scientific scene, um, claimed that there was a significant difference in how scientists versus artists dealt with these, these kind of weird hybrid things that were produced. He said, the artworks we are discussing are like evolutionary things that are not reaching a stage where we have a kind of material thing which humans can control. He said, this is completely different from science. Because in science, he says, when you're doing research, you want an end. You want a result. You want to stabilize something. And this is really important because when we talk about art and science, you know, artists will keep things moving and unstable to the very last minute. And sometimes not even the last minute, but in the actual performance or the exhibition, something is unstable. But scientists want to stabilize this phenomena as they're working in the laboratory. Now, perhaps, um, so that's the second thing, is this idea of a kind of um, tension between laboratory and, and studio. Now, perhaps the most important difference, though, is 
between art and science is this idea of unity uh, versus disunity. Um, so this is this idea that you know, these things are unified. And this is important because um, this goes back to this idea of these kind of no cu cultures of knowledge. In other words, this disunified assemblage of different subcultures of science is precisely what structures um, their coherence uh, and their strength. So disciplines are normally characterized by internal differences. So we tend to think a discipline is everyone thinks the same, right? But in fact, disciplines are characterized by internal differences and fights. The existence of a discipline does not imply that there is an acceptance upon or agreed upon set of methods, of problems, of objects, of theories, and not even a shared language or common institutional kind of setting. You know? So this is really important because we said discipline, everyone thinks the same, but actually they're defined by the tensions and differences within them. Now, it's also really important to remind ourselves that the term, what we consider science now, that we look to with kind of great awe, uh, as a kind of disciplined, methodologically rigorous area, um, which is completely against the kind of intuitive vision of, of art, of the arts, or of artists, was actually from early in European history, from the Greeks through the Middle Ages and Renaissance and so on, very, very different than what we actually now know as science. Okay? And that history is critically important for both dispelling the myth that art and science were actually the same thing, and there are many writers that say this, like um, E.G. Wilson or, or Arthur Miller, you know, art and science are the same, which is not really true. Um, but also, what's important is to understand like, how certain ideas arose at specific times. Right? So that's the kind of historical question. So uh, Peter Weibel wrote a very interesting essay in 2012 called The Post-Media Condition, and he argued that the Greek word techne, as I said earlier, which embodied skill, practice, craft, or practical knowing, was essentially in, in Greek, uh, the Greek context um, completely denigrated. So Plato, and especially Aristotle, held practical knowledge in contempt. And this is why you still have this tension between, like, in universities, between like, those who do theory and those who make things. Right? Um, and Practical knowledge, technique, was pushed to the bottom of the knowledge hierarchy. So there was true knowledge, episteme, up here, and then down there is all the kind of you know, technical things. Now, um, the, uh, later the quadrivium in, um, in, in medieval times was composed of four sciences. Okay? And the sciences were music, but mainly music theory, not music practice, geometry, mathematics, and astronomy. And that quadrivium was meant to join what was called the artes liberales, the liberal arts, uh, or the trivium. And the trivium was logic, grammar, uh, and rhetoric. Okay? So the trivium and the quadrivium were distinguished from their kind of bastard lower counterparts, which were called the artes mechanicae. And the artes mechanicae were architecture, sculpting, weaving, cooking, masonry, agriculture, even martial arts. Uh, and other things. So Weibel says that, quote, the liberal arts, these seven liberal arts, grammar, dialectics, rhetoric, arithmetic, geometry, music theory, and astronomy, formed the curriculum of the monastic and convent schools, and of course, from the 13th century, universities right, in, in, in Europe. While the artists' mechanicae continued to be der derided as kind of banal things, as artis vulgaris et sordidae, basically the kind of sordid, you know, banal thing for the unliberated um, or, the, or the slaves, right? So, so there was already this tension that happened uh, very early on between the liberal arts and the mechanical or the applied arts, okay? Now, in the Enlightenment period, um, starting in the 18th century, um, there was a shift that took place. So uh, Denis Diderot and D'Alembert wrote the, the first encyclopedia, and that encyclopedia began to articulate a new merger of the artist mechanicae and the artist liberales together. So for, for Diderot, art was seen as a kind of instrumental practical action. Okay? So that's very important, right? So as we still understand the arts today as practical things we do, while the sciences were seen as contemplative and speculative. Okay? But art itself joined with science in both 
their, their interest in speculation. So this is really interesting, is that the arts and the sciences linked up because they were both interested in speculation, i.e. in imagining what could actually be. Not what is, but what could be. Um, and there's a very interesting historian of science, Eric Schatzberg, who claimed basically that Diderot said, one cannot advance the practical side of an art without speculation, nor fully grasp the speculative side without practice. So these two things actually operate hand in hand. In effect, Diderot sought to eliminate not only the hierarchy between the practical and speculative arts, but also to find a connection uh, between them. Okay? Now, it took um, almost 200 years for the liberal arts to admit that humans alone might not be the only ones responsible for, uh, for basically how things are produced. It goes back to this idea of, well, what happens to those things that we work with, these so-called non-humans, uh, in the mix? But quickly, this affinity between science and art started to break apart because a new category started to merge in the 19th century, and that's what we call the fine arts, okay? which are essentially painting uh, and sculpture uh, along with music, performance, uh, and so on. So with this categorization of fine art, now you have a split. You have a split between the mechanical arts or the applied arts, you have basic, which are done by craftsmen or artisans, and then you have the fine arts, which are done by individuals who are in inspired by creative genius and inspiration. And then you suddenly have science over here. So you have this weird split that starts to happen. So the mechanical arts, were increasingly reduced to technique, and you still find this tension you know, between artists and technicians, right? Okay, someone's going to engineer this thing for me. Um, the fine arts became the domain of bourgeois, don't, uh, kind of middle class um, men, and the sciences basically became the domain in which knowledge was seen as the core aspect of their production. So the sciences take knowledge on, and they become the premier disciplines where knowledge is created. The arts become the domain of individual geniuses, and the applied arts are seen as just technique. And then actually, in essentially the early part of the 20th century, 1930s, the word technology starts to be used. And it's amazing, because we think technology, well, that's a term that must go back also to the Greeks, because techne is skill and logos is order. So there's all, that, that term has a Greek origin to it. But in fact, uh, it's ra relatively rarely used until the 1920s and 1930s. And even, you know, in French, technique, there's no direct translation to technologie. There's technique, and in German, there's technique as well. So technology is a very recent term. And that term means the sci a science that's concerned with the useful arts. And there, there was an even more radical split between the fine arts and the useful sciences. So power and prestige shifted from the arts to the sciences and from human beings to increasingly mechanicized forms, mechanical forms of material production. Now, as, as we know, um, this link between the arts and the sciences were, was fought over the 20th century, uh, and many worked hard to reunite them. So the Bauhaus, which is celebrating its 100th anniversary this year, um, Walter Gropius is opening Exhibition in 1923 was called Art and Technology, A New Unity, which is very ironic since 1923. And then, as you know today, there's many, many initiatives, festivals, programs, and universities, funding bodies, whatever, to try to link the arts again uh, with the sciences. So, for instance, if you examine the kind of artistic projects here at Kick, you see works that you merge instrumental practical knowledge with speculative visions and experimental practices that the early sciences were identified with, but then got lost along this kind of very instrumentalized uh, path that, that capitalism, of course, has helped shape. So we come to a paradox here, and the paradox is the following. As, as human beings were responsible for ushering in this kind of new geological and technical age, the Anthropocene, which involves this obliteration of the planet we inhabit, and at the same time, our agency is increasingly bracketed and transformed by the technologies we've actually invented, but have become autonomous uh, under our, our watch. So as artists working within the structures of what is called the tech, techno-science, 
This is a term from Belgian philosopher, Gilbert Hautois. Technoscience is essentially this kind of force of science that's been uh, equipped by technology. We're participating both in amplifying and furthering the conditions that we have, even as we critique or rage against them. So what's the conclusion of this? Well, the questions of how artists work within the context of these conditions of the technosphere and the Anthropocene has become, of course, an important topic. So uh, about four or three years ago, uh, Heather Davis and Etienne Turpin put out a book called Art in the Anthropocene that fe featured a whole list of artists, philosophers, natural scientists, sociologists who were trying to respond uh, to the Anthropocene's cat uh, catastrophic uh, consequences. And in that volume, there was a short article from Bruno Latour, and he made a really interesting observation about the current relationship between artists and scientists. He said that given this context, the earlier approaches to the relation between art and science in which artists would, quote, capture some kind of aesthetic aspect of science, unquote, have given, away, given way to a new kind of urgency and narrativity, one which is, which is shared among diverse approaches and disciplines who do not, do not always sit down at the same table. In fact, it seems that like the inevitable disaster of the climate um, brings people together. Now, um, you might be seem almost as deranged in thinking that artists working with this technological instruments that brought us to this kind of condition would be able to push away this experience of what Isabel Stengers has called, li we're living in suspense at the moment, which is a very interesting way of thinking about the situation. So let's pause for a moment from this kind of apocalyptic thinking um, and, and, and step back and say, okay, if we want to dig deeper to answer these questions about basically how do we address this looming catastrophes um, and situation of, of the world, we have to get past first this kind of superficial art and science debate. In fact, in, in a world in which the natural sciences are increasingly subjected to this machinery of the technosphere, if we look for solace in the natural sciences, we're, we're deceiving ourselves, right? There's no notion of a kind of pure nature because nature is already been subjected to a whole kind of technical machinery and instrumentarian. It's always been mitigated and mediated. So let's end with a final radical idea. So I, I wrote this book in 2015 called Alien Agency, um, looking at how artists deal with these kind of questions of like response, responsive matter. How do they work with things they don't know? Um, and I was one of the artists who was kind of writing about my own work, but in relationship to others as well in a kind of anthropological study. Um, and, and what I saw was artists are starting to increasingly contextualize their work um, within this operation of this technosphere. And they have a very different set of claims and objectives um, than natural or even uh, human scientists have when they start working. Um, so when you're working with stuff um, that's in experimental situations, um, many artists claim that their claims are not ontological. What is something? But it, they're very practical. How do we know an aesthetic experiment works? And how do we make conditions possible so it works? But also, I started to see that there were ethical concerns. And what I mean by ethics here is pretty simple. It's how do we understand the effects of what we make in the world and when it goes out there? Um, in other words, research and research-driven kind of artistic practices produce a kind of ethical futurity. And what does this mean? It basically means that by making something, you enact the possibility of something else, and you try to trace its consequences. The artists are enacting a kind of firsthand, concrete, lived, and imminent transformation of us as beings in the world. And, and this is kind of similar to what uh, Francisco Varela called ethical know-how. This is the idea of ethics as practical action in trying to understand our role in the world as opposed to ethics as, quote, detached, critical morality based on prescriptive principles. And this comes up now in all the discussions about AI and so on and so forth, like the normative discussions about ethics. And of course, artists need to be in those discussions because this idea about what's possible versus what is is critical to speculation in general. So why, to finish, why should artists and artistic practice be concerned with this production of ethical futurity? Well, because as artists, we're, we're deeply engaged with and speculating through the, the conditions and the techniques that are bringing about these catastrophic times, seeking to organize apparatuses, instruments, frameworks, publics for materializing this 
ethical futurity through, through what we call the imaginary. And that's the thing we lack so much now, is what are new kinds of imaginaries? You know, it's not the imaginaries of the baby boomer, you know, okay, boomer. It's not the imaginaries of, okay, these robots will do this or that. It's something else. It's something which has not yet come to be. And that's the interesting thing that art does, is actually make that possible. You walk into the future as a participant, as a maker, uh, as a public. And in a lot of ways, this argument complements um, Andy Pickering's um, argument in his book, The Cybernetic Brain, when he looks at basically the cyberneticians in the 1960s in the UK, um, and he identifies this mode of tinkering. And this tinkering mode is more akin to kind of making other worlds possible rather than modeling or representing them. So for instance, Pickering talks about the homeostat from Rosh Ashby or some of you may know, W. Gray Walter, well-known neuroscientist in the 60s, wrote this famous book, The Living Brain, created these tiny little turtles that had sensors on them. They had no kind of code or representation of what the world was. These things moved around and tried to understand their environment. And what Pickering says is these kind of kludged together techniques and tinkering and little devices produced another future. You know, and this is very interesting because this is this idea that the future is materialized. It's not just just it's not just discursive, it's not just talked about, it's materialized in stuff and in action. And these materializations of concepts and apparatuses provide us with an, another way of thinking about how things may be, as opposed to what may, things are. So these materializations might even provide us with a lived experience of how non-human alien systems um, not only, of course, animals and plants, things, but also these machines that people are increasingly building, um, how they also might co-occupy and co-produce the world that we're increasingly all inhabiting together. So the question of speculative and technical practices that asks the artists in this festival, but also you as an audience, is a simple one, but it's also confounding, and that is the following. What kind of world can be imagined, and how do we live and act in it. Thanks very much.